feeling in the back of my mind. And since that time, that feeling has been growing stronger and stronger every day. Even though the feeling is still in the back of my mind, it's now also in the front of my side. A couple of weeks ago, Brother Eric and I went to the Mill Hill Island Conference in San Francisco. And all the way up there, we had a chance to talk about it. Yeah, it's been a wonderful opportunity to come up here and try to have to see how I'm doing and have to accept it. Brother Eric, I'm glad you've given us that opportunity. We had a lot of time to talk about it because I told him I knew exactly where we were going. It didn't take long to figure out that I didn't have the slightest idea where we were going. The only bad thing about it is when Brother Eric figured it out before I did. <laughs> Open your Bible this morning to Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. <laughs> Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in our synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. As the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus was going out, teaching and preaching everywhere that there were people who wanted to listen to him. And obviously there were people who wanted to listen to him because everywhere he went for a great multitude of people. The Bible talks of 5,000 such people who wanted to hear what he had to say so desperately that they didn't even bother to take the time to prepare any food to bring. When Jesus talked, people listened. They wanted to hear what he had to say. They wanted to know what he was all about. Do you want to know what Jesus is about? I pray that you do. I can't tell you all of what Jesus is about. Only he can. Look down on verse 37. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. The harvest is plentiful. Now folks, that's an understatement. The harvest is enormous. It's huge. And if you open your eyes and start looking around, it won't take you very long to figure it out. It is enormous. Go home and turn on the news and see how long it will take you to figure it out. It won't take very long, I guarantee it. If someone isn't getting killed by a gun, they're getting killed by a drunk driving home. What is going on, folks? Bill Clinton can't figure it out. He says we have to have awareness. I don't know about you, but that's just about the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. <laughs> if the people of the United States are not aware of the problems of the United States, then the people of the United States will never know the problems of the United States. Then he says we need more law enforcement out on the streets. No, folks, we don't need more law enforcement out on the streets of America. We need Jesus out on the streets of America. And until we get Jesus out on the streets of America, the problems of America will never be solved. That is the only way. Go to town on Friday or Saturday night. Pass by all the bars in town. And I guarantee they will all be filled to capacity. You will not even be able to find a parking spot in front of them. I guarantee it. The harvest is plentiful. And you don't have to look very hard or very long to figure it out. It's enormous. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. The workers are few. Now that's another understatement. You know what amazes me when I think to myself how Christianity was started? Just guessing, I don't know for sure, but I'm guessing that there are millions of Christians all over the world. They have Christians in Russia now, 
They even have Christians in China now. They have Christians in countries that I've never even heard of. It amazes me to think that Christianity was basically performed by one man, Jesus Christ. People would hear Jesus and they would learn from Jesus and they would absorb Jesus' teaching and they would go out and tell other people about Jesus. And the people they would tell would go out and tell other people about Jesus. And that process has been repeated now for almost 2,000 years. The only problem now is people are hearing about Jesus. They're just not telling anyone about it. How many times have you went to the show and you liked the show so much you just couldn't stop telling people about it? Well, hopefully you know what Jesus is about. Hopefully you've already watched the main show. Now go out and tell someone about it. And if you haven't watched the show, then you better watch it because it's the only show you'll ever watch worth watching. Well, that's what we pay the preacher for, isn't it? That's his job, isn't it? That's his responsibility, isn't it? No, folks. As Christians, that is all of our job. That is all of our responsibility. Every single one of us. Picture this. The U.S. Marine Company in battle near land on a beach. And all the soldiers go over here and they sit underneath the palm tree in the shade. All except the commanding officer. Now he's got a M60 on his shoulder, an M16 in his hand, grenades on his belt, 45 in his boot. He's all decked out. He charges into the, war, into the jungle and goes to war. About a week later, he comes back. His clothes are torn. He's out of ammunition. And his soldiers mend him up a little bit, reload his ammunition, pat him on the back, tell him you're doing a good job. Keep up the good work. See you in another week. Sounds kind of ridiculous, right? Wars aren't won that way, are they? Well, then if it sounds so ridiculous, then why are we doing it? Why are churches all across the United States doing it? It's time to wake up and stop blaming everyone else for the problems of the world and start doing something about it. If you don't like the world that you're living in, then do something about it. Bring people to Jesus. That's the only way. There is no other way. Well, I'd like to go out and talk to people and witness to people about Jesus, tell people about Jesus, but I don't really know what I'm going to give you The Bible says now would be a real good time. Jesus says now would be an excellent time. John 4, verse 35 and 36 says, Do you not say four months more and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the field. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the reaper draws his wings. Even now, he harvests the crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Jesus says, don't wait. The time is now. Open your eyes. Look at the field. The time for harvest is now. Not four months from now. Not four weeks from now, but right now. Well, I've never had any type of training. I've never taken any classes. I've never been trained without a witness to someone. How many times have you ever read your Bible about Paul taking classes or getting trained on witnessing? Paul was led by the Holy Spirit and so should we be led also. All and thousands. Do you hear me? Thousands of people to Jesus. Paul was led by the Holy Spirit. Philippians 4, verse 13 says, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. I can do anything through him who gives me strength. The only way that you can do anything is through the Lord. He will help you. He will give you the strength. He will give you the strength to do anything. All you have to do is ask him. Don't get me wrong, I don't see anything wrong with taking some classes or getting some training. I'd like to take some classes or get some training myself. Been reading some books on it. Brother Eric, let me borrow one from him the other day called Winning Ladies. It's a good book. All I'm trying to say is if you 
don't have the Lord helping you, helping you, then you can do nothing. You would fail. I think it's good to be prepared, though. You need to be prepared. I heard a story the other day about a young man who wasn't prepared. He was coming home from a Bible conference. As he was coming home from that Bible conference, he was so excited about the Lord, he just couldn't control himself. He was driving down the highway and he saw a hitchhiker on the side of the road. When he saw that hitchhiker, he slammed on the brakes, jumped down the car, ran over the hitchhiker and said, You bet die! He didn't understand why the hitchhiker took off running through the woods like he did. He wasn't prepared. And no, that wasn't me either. <laughs> you have to be prepared. Well, how are you prepared? It's simple. Those of you who are reading out the NIV Bible, the first three words in Matthew 9, verse 38, 10, ask the Lord. Ask the Lord. Pray about it. Pray for the Lord's guidance. Pray that He will give you the strength. Pray that He will give you the courage. Pray that He will show you what to say or how to say it. Pray for the person that you are witnessing to. Pray with the person you are witnessing to. The most important thing about your prayer isn't how distinguished you sound when you pray. It isn't how formal your prayer is. God doesn't care how distinguished you are. He doesn't care about formality. The most important thing you need to have when you pray is faith. Have faith in your prayer. Have faith in the one that you are praying to. Don't say, well, God, I'm going to go over here and talk to my next door neighbor. I don't think it's going to do a whole lot of good, but I'm going to talk to him anyway. He drinks a lot, he does a lot. I doubt it's going to do any good, but I'm going to go talk to him anyway. Well, chances are, if you don't think it's going to do a whole lot of good, then it's not going to do a whole lot of good, and you might as well not even waste your time doing it. You need to have faith. I heard a story a couple of weeks ago about a boy who was playing in a football game. As he was playing in that football game, the Lord started giving him a powerful conviction about not being saved. And the boy felt like he was fixing to die right there on the spot if he didn't get saved. He prayed to the Lord, said, Lord, just help me get through this football game, and I promise you I'll get saved. After the football game was over with, he went over to the sidelines, and he was saved right there on the spot. Then he ran all the way home and found his mom. He said, Mom, Mom, I've been saved, I've been saved. She said, Huh? He said, Mom, didn't you hear me? I've been saved. She said, I hope so. He said, well, how do you know? She said, well, I prayed to the Lord about it. He said, anything that I ask for, he'll give me. I said, go in there and take a bath and get ready for bed because I made arrangements for you to give a testimony at church in the morning. Now that is having faith. I guarantee you, if we had half of that little faith, we would get some things accomplished. We would start saving some souls. And that is the name of the game. That is the beginning of the victory. Another very important way to be prepared is to know your Bible. How are you going to go out and tell somebody about what is written in the Bible when you don't even know what's written in it yourself? How are you going to answer questions about the Bible when you don't even know what's in it? You've never heard of a film critic talking about a film you've never seen, never watched, doesn't have a clue what it's about. So how can you tell someone about the Word of God when you don't even know it's about yourself? You need to know your Bible. You need to know the Word of God. Ephesians 6 verse 11 says, Put on the whole armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. So put on the full armor of God by being prepared. Put on the full armor of God by praying to Him. Put on the full armor of God by having faith 
in him. Put all of the full armor of God by knowing his word. And go out and fight the devil's scheme. Go out and be victorious with Jesus by winning souls. If you don't like this world that you're living in, then do something about it. Just think what a wonderful world this would be if we were all Christians. No wars. No problems. The only problem we would have then would be how to get everybody to come back. <laughs> Don't do it because you feel obligated to do it. Don't do it because you feel like you have to do it. Do it because you want to do it. Do it because you don't want to see anyone spend eternity in hell. Do it out of love. Well, you might be saying, well, I don't want it. Yes, we are. We are in a war right now. We are in a spiritual war right now. A war that we desperately need to recruit some more soldiers to help fight that war. I want to bring up one final thing this morning before we go. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this, not from yourself, but is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can vote. You have been saved by grace, not by works. It is a gift of God. There is nothing you can do on your own that will get you into heaven. Jesus is the only way. Jesus is the only way to heaven. Jesus is the one way ticket to heaven. Do you have that ticket? I pray that you do. If you don't, I pray that you'll get it. You don't know what's waiting outside those doors. But I do know this. Jesus is waiting outside your heart. Jesus is waiting to come in. He's waiting to be invited in. You're not waiting on Jesus to invite himself in. He's waiting on you to invite him in. You don't know what's outside those doors. But Jesus is outside your heart. He's waiting to come in. I pray that you won't put them on any longer. Today is the day. Amen. Amen. Listen, folks, there are people all around us that come to Jesus. There are people all around this community that never come to know Christ for the Lord and Savior. My responsibility to tell folks about Jesus is just as much your responsibility to tell folks. <laughs> folks, we need to be about the business of telling folks about Christ. It could be this morning that you're here and you've never come to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Fred, I want you to know that God loves you so much that in spite of your sin, in spite of your rebellion, God sent His Son Jesus into this world to die upon a cross for all your sins. Not only did He die, rose again from the dead. You know what God wants to do for you? But one thing He wants to give you a home in heaven. But not only that, He wants to come and take your life. He wants to come and take up residence in your life where He begins to make you more and more like Jesus every day. He wants to be the Lord, your master. He wants to be the one that takes charge of your life, leads you and guides you. And you. That's the kind of life that He wants you to have. You know, you've got to invite him in. Just like Rusty said a moment ago, he's not going to force his way into your life. But he's knocking at the door of your heart and he wants to come inside. You've got to open the door. You know how you open the door? You just simply invite him. First of all, you need to admit that you're a sinner. Admit that you've sinned and that you're separated from God. Secondly, you need to believe with all of your heart that Jesus died on the cross for all your sins and rose again from the dead. And third, you need to be willing to let him come in your heart. Listen, I want you to understand something. When you accept Christ into your life to be saved, you're not just accepting him as your Savior. 
But you're accepting him in your life as your Lord. You're inviting him in to be the boss of your life. Where from that point on, you're going to be seeking to obey him and do what he wants you to do. If you're willing to let him come in to be the Lord of your life, then by faith you just simply need to ask him to come into your life. Pray something like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I need your forgiveness. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. I want you to come into my heart and be my Lord, my master. I want you to take over my life. And Lord, from this day forward, my life belongs to you. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. I pray that you will pray that and need it from the bottom of your heart. The Bible promises that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation now. Hymn number 305, I have decided to follow Jesus. And as we sing this in the invitation, if you're here today and you're not saved, but you want to be saved, then make your way down one of these aisles and come and take my hands and say, I want to pray today and invite Christ to come into the life. If you accepted the Lord sometime this past week and uh, you are coming to make that public, then you come forward at this time. If you are a Christian and you need to recommit your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and say, hey, what Rusty's been talking about, I agree with it. And I as a Christian need to commit my life to being a better witness for Jesus. Then you come right now and come to make that profession this morning. Maybe there's some other decision that God has laid upon your heart. But this is the time to do it. Let's stand and turn to him number 305.